welcome all back to this uh, second session of Academy Camp number five. Thank you for, well, you know, trusting us and uh, being with us. It's a pleasure to continue the work with uh, Jordi Pascual, our partner here for this Academy Camp number five, and who is uh, managing these conversations with our uh, lead experts uh, for the uh, previous four Academy Camps. So this morning, we engaged in a conversation with Cristina Namilano from ECOM uh, on audience development, Academy Camp number one. And now for this second session, second session, but third Academy Camp, it will be Silvia Mann, director of InfoRolet, who accompanied us uh, for and with uh, Vesprem Balaton uh, on uh, the issue of international cultural cooperation, vast subject, which uh, thanks to your approach, uh, Silvia, we opened up further than Europe because we also talked about going beyond uh, our European borders. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Silvia. Welcome. And Jordi, of course, the uh, floor is yours uh, for this first part of the conversation and then the second part during which we will engage with colleagues from Vesprem Balaton in particular, but also other invited guests. Thank you all very much. Go ahead, Jordi, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Mercedes. I have the great pleasure to be convening this conversation with Silvia Aman, great colleague, a wonderful expert. She is the director of InfoRelay in Austria, tailoring services for culture and uh, creative industries policy development. She chaired the European Union Creative Industries Expert group. She also chaired the European Capital of Culture Monitoring and Evaluation Panel, the jury that decides the European Capitals of Culture. So many, many of you European Capitals of Culture have met her. More than two years of experience in European cultural cooperation, also active globally, involved in several initiatives in Asia Pacific, in Africa, in Latin America also. I had the pleasure to, to share with you, Silvia, a transfer of knowledge between the European capital of culture and the Ibero-American city of culture. Uh, and you're also involved in the, in the development of the African capital of culture with, with us uh, and with UCLG Africa. So a great pleasure to, to, to hold this conversation with, with, with you. As in the morning, I will try to make this conversation uh, a, a real conversation. I will ask uh, some, some questions, uh, but uh, considering your, uh, your words, I would ask for, for further explanation or complementary information on some of the of the issues you will you will develop, and the first the first question is is quite easy. Always, uh, it is it is obvious in the case of this European Capital of Culture capacity building, because European and uh, international uh, dimension is one of the key elements compulsory mandatory elements of the of the candidacy but let me go to the to the foundation to the basis why is uh, international cooperation why is european cooperation something that any cultural organization should should consider should have in its program mm. yes thank you Jordi, for first the introduction and the very kind words you asked a big why question, Jordi. Why should we uh, cooperate internationally? And I would say it should be something uh, completely natural. As uh, there is, uh, if you dig a little bit deeper, I do not really see uh, how um, all the local activities could not have international or even global dimension or cross-border dimension. So we are all, I think, much more connected than uh, it is in our minds, in our everyday action. 
And um, already in that sense, uh, I think it, uh, it's something quite natural which we should um, develop much more. I could also say it a little bit more political. If we look at the future transformations ahead of us, I could not imagine one single answer which uh, can, uh, can be solved without global cooperation. So, and in that sense, uh, we need culture in order to go ahead and to learn to go ahead together. Very clear and very, and very sharp. In the academic camp of Vesprem, you agreed on, the, on a set of recommendations for uh, writing, uh, elaborating uh, partnerships. Uh, when, when you are appointed as European Capital of Culture, you, you are supposed to build uh, partnerships with the uh, other European Capitals of Culture, uh, other prominent cities uh, that are developing similar uh, topics to the ones you are uh, developing, to the ones the capital city is developing. Um, what are the lessons learned of these of this, uh, uh, partnerships, European and international partnerships that uh, European Capital of Culture should, should consider? Mm. Uh, first, maybe um, to um, frame it uh, in a little bit the broader context, uh, these um, partnerships. Um, normally, uh, in European capitals of culture and also in culture in general, people often think that um, international cooperation is a synonymous uh, for um, cultural uh, exchange or artistic cooperation. I think um, this would uh, missing out some important elements in European capitals of culture for which uh, European cooperation and building up of partnerships could be of considerable added value. So in that sense, I think the first lesson I would like to state here is the lesson that European dimension concerns all six criteria, all six chapters of a bit book and also then the related implementation. So let's just think uh, maybe on the first uh, chapter, uh, it's about cultural strategy. So a European capital of culture is not only a one year celebration, it's a multi-annual transformation process of an urban area uh, by the means of culture, arts, creative industries, creativity, etc. So already, for example, in the cultural strategy development, uh, it makes sense uh, to uh, to go for peer learning, to connect with international initiatives like the Agenda 21 for Culture or with other kind of, of peer learning programs and, and support. So already there to consider this, uh, these elements as being also concerned by European cooperation and exchange, I think is crucially important. Uh, then uh, the next thing is I um, or next lesson learned is that um, when you start preparing a European capital of culture already to have this European and international dimension as an integrative part from the very beginning. So not as an add on, not to say, okay, first we do a local uh, project or we try to build up a local project and then we look further, but already to understand that in the whole planning process uh, that it's of added value to reach out to European partners, to, to learn, to get inspired and already um, elements or structures like the ECOG fora, these gatherings, these informal meetings are excellent places uh, to, uh, to get in touch, to get inspiration, uh, to exchange, etc. Then um, we still observe that um, in ECOG, maybe the ECOG Foundation or the main implementation body uh, is very well aware about this need of European and international cooperation. 
but uh, not yet mainstreamed is uh, that all uh, cultural organizations in the city should benefit of this big European project in that sense that they are all getting somehow experts for European and international cooperation. And last but not least, uh, I think there should be also understood the European dimension as an integrative part of the legacy of an echo. That means uh, to understand all these efforts, not ending then with the echo here, and then somehow to say, okay, now it's done, and we do maybe a nice publication, and then it's over, and we go to the next topic. But to understand that this is a strategic project, a strategic transformation process to build up also uh, skills, capacities uh, in European cooperation to build up networks and partnerships for the for long term cooperation so that this European dimension remains something which is integrative for city development, then also in the years after. You have mentioned four, four elements, uh, Silvia. The, the first one is, is very interesting. It is very dear to what to what we do. Uh, here in United Cities and local and local governments, we were born out of the the, the worry to to provide uh, a good frame for cities, willing to to have uh, a cultural policy that responds to cultural rights. Uh, say it in 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 one sentence. Um, you have been involved, you have been in contact with, with uh, great European cities, those that have integrated the European and the international dimension in their, in their cultural strategies. Uh, what, what examples come to your mind? Either uh, European capitals of culture or other cities that, that have this, have experience, have successfully integrated uh, these analyses of uh, other cities, other examples in their, in their cultural strategy. The long-term, we are talking about the long-term cultural strategy. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe I would rather take the occasion to travel outside Europe, because I think it's also important to understand that this is a global trend, that cities uh, try to improve their cultural policies, try to, uh, to connect to international networks. And um, I, I would like to refer here uh, maybe to the, the cities of uh, La Paz and also of uh, Chinchu. So La Paz in Bolivia and Chinchu in South Korea. And uh, I was deeply impressed by both uh, how they um, have, um, from the very beginning, as far as I understood these examples, uh, tried to connect to, to international know-how, to understand how others do, uh, to invite then the project promoters from other continents to, to learn, to, uh, to share their concerns, their difficult questions, to be open also uh, that not everything is perfect, that it's not about showcasing, but really about uh, learning, connecting, uh, bringing common uh, objectives together and to, to be international from the, from the very beginning. I had the pleasure, for example, to be in Chinchu. Chinchu is a middle-sized city in the south of South Korea. Korea for their first uh, international conference where they connected to a uh, whole of uh, East Asia uh, plus uh, Yes, um, how could I say, uh, post-Soviet uh, Union countries plus uh, European uh, experts and, and, and good practice uh, promoters. Um, so in that sense, already from the very beginning to say, uh, there is so much outside from what we can learn, on, from what we can get uh, inspiration. And I think this is really something uh, which could uh, serve as a model and also the openness to address uh, challenges and problems. I think this is something from which we can uh, really, really learn. 
And uh, La Paz, very similar. I know it a little bit less. I think, surely you know it a little bit more than I know it. But for many, many years, really a front runner in uh, many of the uh, crucial uh, topics for, for city development. I recall also some very ambitious uh, activities related to creative industries, fashion industry, with a lot of international success. and. Uh, all these uh, examples are in front of our nose, uh, just to be uh, open-minded and to open doors and to listen and to exchange. And it can be so inspiring and so motivating to go ahead uh, with, uh, with uh, strategic development. This is very interesting. You say in, in your initial remarks, you said something which uh, touched me is uh, we're going to need uh, the international connections. It's not, say, uh, decorative or an added value or an, an added component of the cultural strategy or not an, uh, a decorative component of the ECO program. It is something we need. Uh, in the current, say, stage of the global conversation on what development is, mm -hmm. uh, can can you can you explain a little bit more that 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 thing? Yeah. So let, let's make it very concrete. Let's think about the climate change, for example. And we know all uh, that at the very end, uh, now there is a crucial need that. Uh, people uh, engage for that. I think the only way now to, to, to solve somehow or to solve partly uh, that challenge is that people engage, engage um, not only verbally, but also in, in their actions. So uh, we need in that sense uh, also uh, players international players who are able to go uh, or to come closely uh, to the citizens. And there the cities, the urban areas have a crucial role to play because there is a possibility or a, maybe a better possibility to connect to, to people than from the national level. Because by, by all your activities in the cities, you are closer uh, and you are also able to do uh, model action, even when national policies go somehow crazy and do not uh, find common how could I say common ground for, for positive solutions? So we see uh, when we look at the international cooperation level and very uh, sharply right now with what is happening in the Ukraine, that this kind of nation states and nationalism uh, brings us to conflict. So we need other actors who are able to connect to people and then also to connect internationally. So in that sense, maybe it's getting a little bit complex. So let's see, uh, to work again with an example. When Trump was in power in the US, the cities continued, uh, many, many US cities continued to engage uh, for climate uh, change mitigation actions. And this is a little bit what I mean. If we could build international solidarities uh, on this local level, uh, we could counterbalance these problems we are having currently on the national level. And if we want to do that, we need to connect with the people on the local level. And the, the bridge builder per se is culture, arts, common activities. And this is somehow where cultural policy can connect with all the other uh, policy areas. Yes, yes. In the area of culture, I'm happy to mention here the, the work of the International Cities of Refuge Network, the ICORN, uh, a global network that uh, hosts, connects uh, those programs, those local programs that host artists that are in danger, artists that are persecuted. Um, 
a very important network that now is playing uh, a very important role in the current crisis because of the Russian invasion uh, to Ukraine. And another very important uh, global network that cares for this connectivity is uh, the PEN International. Uh, a century uh, of work in uh, defending the rights of uh, writers and the right the, the rights for self uh, expression and yeah there are very very good examples also in the mm. in the in the cultural field exactly so this is uh, this level on which uh, we need to strengthen this connectivity and if there is an underlying understanding that all our challenges are also international, yeah, from that moment on, we can do another kind of, of, of cultural policy, another kind of support program, um, and enhance this dimension. Another element that you mentioned in your, in your, uh, in your, in, in your list is that uh, all actors in the city, all cultural actors in the city should be aware, uh, should include this European and international dimension. Uh, of, co of course, big fish, opera houses, museums, the festivals, they, they already have it. They, they are most of, more often, very often they are already in international networks. But what what about the not that big uh, players? How, how an European capital of culture can uh, support the connectivity of the small and medium uh, size cultural initiatives that are, mm. I would say, more important for local economic local development than the big fish. Mm. I think we must see here different elements. One is uh, the, the fact that more and more European capitals of culture are hosted from smaller cities. So I think uh, many of them do even not have these big opera houses and these big art centers, which are already not only in the EU, but also globally connected. I think this is more really a phenomena of the, of the big metropolises, if they are capitals cities or not, but many of the echo cities are smaller middle or middle-sized cities. And so there is certainly also a, a part of the institutions which is already in European programs. We discover them, for example, in Creative Europe uh, projects or applications. And so there is already a certain connectivity, a certain exchange, uh, a certain level of partnership established. Uh, then for the smaller ones, I think there are still many who are not connected and there is also the question uh, with whom to connect, uh, where to connect, how to connect and how to finance then also uh, these corporations. And um, often in the framework of, for example, EU funding, we have to go away then from Creative Europe. So the Erasmus program provides good uh, support uh, possibilities. There should be also starting a new program very soon. It's Erasmus for Culture. And in that sense, um, there is possibility for mobility also. So you have not only the small organizations, but also uh, individual individuals or individual artists or individual cultural researchers who will have more opportunities to get uh, abroad, to go to conferences, to do small research work, to do uh, cooperative artistic projects, etc. So in that sense, there is um, lots of new possibilities. I think uh, the many, many complaints for many years on EU level that not sufficient support is available for the smaller organization uh, has been now, um, yes, found some, some uh, concrete and good answers. And one is this upcoming Erasmus for Culture. Can you explain a little bit more uh, what this Erasmus for Culture is about? 
Yes, so this is based on uh, two or three pilot activities on the EU level. This uh, was called iPortunos, and it was managed by Goethe Institute and by the European Cultural Foundation, and it allowed for mobility support of individuals. So uh, that means uh, people often lack uh, of um, small budget in order to do their first international exchange or to pursue uh, an international artistic cooperation. And exactly to fill that gap, this iPortunus program provided support for two years uh, of, uh, or during two years you could apply. <laughs> And uh, now it was um, understood that it's successful and it's really needed and that there is a lot of interest and therefore it should become a permanent support instrument now. Uh, it will be put on a new institutional ground in the course of this year and then it should be operational uh, during maybe still 2022 but maybe beginning 2023 and is a very flexible tool for mobility support. So imagine I am the director of a library in Clermont-Ferrand, mm -hmm. or I am uh, uh, an employee in uh, the Museum of uh, Braga. Mm -hmm. uh, would I be able to, to, to ask for funding to Erasmus for Culture? Normally, yes, we must always see the details of the call, but uh, in a way, this was the case so far. And also, if you are an individual artist and you are based in Vesprem, uh, you should be also able to, uh, to apply to add an additional category to, to your list. Good, very good. Let me, let me also add that, uh, as, as you, you know, Sylvia, we are in United Cities and Local Governments, we are quite closely connected with the International Federation of Libraries and with the International Council on Monuments and Sites. Uh, almost impossible that a city has not the city library and the local museum uh, or the, the main monument uh, or the main site. And th these two organizations, because uh, I, am, I am discovering step by step the complexity of both and uh, but also the capacity of both they have wonderful committees subcommittees on uh, great issues such as uh, gender equality climate action uh, rural development and I, I i am enthusiastic about the the capacity they have to connect a small and medium uh, size uh, cities and, and, and initiatives. Hmm. Maybe to add also on what we have just said before, it's not only about uh, financing opportunities like the EU funds for which we provided one example, but also to engage in these networks is also a great opportunity for smaller organizations. Uh, it helps on many levels. So uh, you get easily then contact to a wide range of different, uh, to different countries, uh, different uh, organizations, but which work in very similar objectives than yourself. And also, uh, it's also a good starting point to get ready then for maybe bigger EU applications. So even a smaller organization who is maybe not able to take the lead on the Creative Europe uh, application uh, can by the means, for example, of networks, identify bigger organizations in that network who are able to, to take the lead and then join, for example, as a project partner also. Another of the elements you mentioned is the legacy and, and how the European capital of culture uh, should, should plan uh, the legacy. And I understand the, the sustainability of the international and the European uh, connections. Can you explain a little bit about that? Can you elaborate a little bit? little bit more on the, the importance of legacy? First of all, maybe to explain the term of legacy. So yes. 
is um, what we use as jargon uh, in the European capitals of culture uh, communities, I would say, uh, for the time after the echo here. So this is the uh, legacy, legacy years, etc. You can find all these uh, all these terms. Uh, Jordi, you already said yes for the sustainability of the project. So the question, what remains? And uh, this comes also still from um, this kind of uh, starting point of the European capitals of culture, where this was merely a one year cultural celebration, one year artistic program. And then the whole initiative uh, was transformed uh, to a long term transformation uh, of an urban area. So we speak uh, about maybe um, two years of preparation of the bid, uh, then uh, four to five years to prepare the echo here. Then we are having the echo here, and then we are having the sustainable effect, the legacy, what remains. So the whole process of an echo, I would rather say we speak about the period of 10 years. So uh, I explained already from the very beginning uh, that uh, the European and international dimension is that what, what the European capital of culture also uh, differs from uh, normal local cultural development process because from the very beginning it has this European dimension for which I say it's a transversal a transversal dimension. So also already in that logic, uh, of course, when I say the European dimension is transversal, it should be then also transversal for everything which remains. So uh, what we have maybe to, to highlight one element out of these uh, different legacy elements, uh, very often we still see, and we have seen also in past years when the echo here is over, that maybe the organizations which have done the echo, uh, they are most often closed uh, a year after. So, for example, you have an ECOC in uh, 2021, 2022, and then these organizations uh, do not exist anymore from 2023 onward, for example. But this means also that all the competences uh, which were accumulated in this organization especially also related to European networking, to European cooperation, to EU project management competences, disappears because these people are look, have to look for other jobs, they go to other organizations, many of them even leave the city, which was the European capital of culture. And this is something which is uh, wasting, uh, wasting a lot of, uh, uh, how could I say, potential, yeah? Because when you build up for, for eight, nine years uh, a topic and, uh, and related competences and related teams, and then you shut down, uh, it's a pity and you should not do. So there should be from the very beginning reflection how these... Uh, these masterminds for European cooperation you have built up, how they can continue to work in the city, in cultural organizations uh, in the city, or also that maybe even is considered that this ECOC Foundation becomes, for example, I don't know, the International Cultural Cooperation Center or something like that for the city. Any example of uh, European capital of culture that has been successfully addressing this 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 fact. The yeah, there is, uh, for example, as far as I understood, for example, Paulina, who will speak still this afternoon, is one of these people who continued after the echo here, and still works on international outreach and is is present on uh, on these kind of exchanges. And, and this is one example, I think she will, uh, or she can highlight that uh, afterwards herself. We developed the, the partnerships uh, side. In Vesprem, you also developed uh, two other important areas. 
financing and uh, communication. Um, let, let me ask on financing first, because you, you, you have already uh, mentioned uh, Creative Europe, the, the adaptive capacity of this program or the, 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 the fact that this program has adapted to the, to the needs of European capitals of culture, of uh, their international and European uh, connectivity. Uh, but perhaps you can, you can share a little bit more on the, the key advice on uh, financing the European and the uh, international cultural cooperation of ECOX? Yes, of course. Um, you mentioned already the Creative Europe uh, program or Creative Europe budget. Um, so also uh, maybe for those, those joining us who are not so familiar with the European Capital of Culture financing context, the Creative Europe program provides also direct financing for the selected uh, European capitals of culture. So there is uh, this trend, but in addition, of course, uh, uh, ECOC foundations and also all cultural operators in the related cities and regions are invited to join Creative Europe calls uh, to participate in related uh, projects and, and activities as uh, leading uh, organizations or also as project partners. Uh, especially as we are having many also smaller European capitals of culture with also then often smaller cultural institutions. As I said also previously, it might be a good strategy to join first as a partner organization and maybe to consider leading only a little bit uh, later when having made the uh, first experiences as partner. What we observe in general is quite a strong focus on Creative Europe, maybe be also Erasmus uh, calls uh, in the European context. Um, and what would be uh, a clear advice also from my side is to use much more also the regional funds. Uh, so there is a huge policy on European regional uh, development. It includes also the cross-border programs uh, like Interreg. And when we think, for example, about uh, the situation of different economic cities just uh, here in Central Europe. It would be also just an excellent opportunity to further use the Interreg programs together. And um, the Interreg programs have also very interesting element as uh, they can uh, combine urban development uh, with cultural development or also innovative or, or sustainable tourism development. So often uh, topics very closely linked to European Capital of Culture initiatives and which could be also, we discussed about that also already previously, uh, be very interesting related to legacy again. So because these are multi-annual projects uh, as uh, it links also very much to, to uh, city topics. Uh, so in that sense, it could be a very interesting element in that sense too. And provide them the financing to continue activities, to pay uh, uh, people and uh, to maintain uh, some of the key areas of an ECOC project. This is nicely explained. Um, I like the Interreg. Uh, you explained it very well. The the connection between several of the of the challenges in an European capital of culture are are uh, uh, well well um, well considered uh, in a natural way, in a in a not not difficult way uh, to become operational in in. In European capitals of culture, um, but of course, this this also involves uh, a very close relation between the cultural actors, those that govern, rule the European capital of culture, and the other planning, the planning of the public spaces or the planning of territorial development, which is not is not always uh, easy. That that connection locally yeah. is not always is not always done. 
Yeah, therefore, it could be also wise uh, to consider to maintain, for example, the ECOC Foundation or the ECOC Association because it's often publicly owned. And it could be, in that sense, a very good arm length uh, organization for, uh, for example, exactly interreg applications, because these kind of organizations are able to build the bridges between the public sector and the cultural operators. We see often that the cultural operators are not having the capacities to manage a whole interreg project. We see on the other side that cities often struggle with their very strict frameworks. So they have very complex decision making. Uh, they have often also overly complex uh, internal rules related to public procurement. They are often having also difficulties to employ staff or additional staff. And all these could be solved by these arm length bodies like the ECOC foundations, because they are close enough in order to be able to influence local policies and, and to interact deeply uh, with, uh, with the institutions, with the, with the administration. And on the other hand, they would be able to connect more deeply to all the NGOs, private actors, etc. So they would have an ideal bridge builder function in them. Yeah, very well said, very well explained, um, Sylvia. Let's go to the. Anything uh, more to add, Sylvia, on the on the financing and the lessons learned? Uh, I am I am considering mm. the the report that you wrote for the Vesprem uh, Academy Camp in 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 uh, autumn uh, last last year. Uh, do you do you have anything else to share? Uh, on, on financing before we go to the third uh, element to communication? I, uh, you know, I like always to, to understand a little bit the bigger context also and try to, to bring forward the related cultural policy debate. And when you look in general at uh, funding sources for international cooperation, be it uh, uh, inside Europe or also then beyond, we are having often the problem outside EU funds uh, that this is often a small budget, irregular calls, uh, also often not really based on strategies. And um, if ECOC could also join the voices to tell national authorities to professionalize their international support programs, I think it would be of great help for all of us. What do you mean? <laughs> I, I understood you, I understood you, but I think that what you are asking needs, needs more explanation. So let, let, me, let me try to, to say it in other words and please, please comment and amend. What you're saying is that the national ministries for culture or the foreign affairs ministers, uh, ministries in EU member states do not sufficiently support European and international international cultural cooperation programs is that is that right yes okay and 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 this is something that you would like mm -hmm. to boost yes okay exactly yeah because this is often the missing link so also, you know, for example, the EU programs, and then you need the co-financing. You do not have, and then you run to 10 people and 10 different administrations in order to collect a little bit of co-financing because there is not really a big program or big budget somewhere. And what we also see in many member states that there is not always a good cooperation between ministries of culture and ministries of foreign affairs. So these are often very diver diverging uh, policies, etc. Instead of putting uh, resources together and building a strong element in that in many countries, this is a quite chaotic thing. All right, good. Let, let me also add that the, the European Union has uh, interesting funding schemes for local authorities working in, uh, in Africa, 
in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, uh, under this ACP, Africa Caribbean Pacific uh, program, um, which are yeah interest of interest to to European capitals of culture. But here I am I am afraid that the time frames for uh, the programs are not not uh, very suitable. Um, I mean I think that only if the European capital of culture is appointed immediately after, uh, only if immediately after the appointment, the city is connecting to these uh, non-European funding schemes, it will be successful in obtaining some, some of these uh, funds or being able to aspire to obtain those funds because those, those partnerships are not easy to, to be built. But let me also add, and I would like to, to, to in, the, in, the, in the second round, uh, to listen to your opinion on, on, on this, the relation with European capitals of culture and other uh, global initiatives. I believe this is uh, of paramount importance, but let's, let's, let's consider this in the second, in the second round. Let's go to the, to the communication, uh, Sylvia, to the, to the lessons learned on the communication uh, side. Uh, you discussed in Vespren, you, 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 you uh, wrote uh, good recommendations on, on this uh, uh, dimension. Can you summarize those recommendations, please? Yeah, maybe to highlight some of those. Um, I think um, what we must know or what we know is that European capitals of culture are also done, of course, to be on the map. That means to be seen more, to be visited more, to be uh, in, in more interaction and exchange. So in that sense, of course, uh, international cooperation is something very important and something very crucial to all these projects. But at the same time, it's also very challenging. Uh, because as an ECOC organization, um, these institutions become an additional player in an already existing international communication framework, which is most often dominated by tourism. So as this links then closely to, to uh, tourism and to cultural tourism, uh, we also invited uh, thinkers, researchers in that area in order to understand a little bit better future trends related to uh, international tourism communication or international tourism activities. And so in that sense, I think uh, main lesson learned, which is uh, now uh, more widely discussed in tourism is that tourism needs a change and that we must stop uh, talking about tourists, but uh, uh, more about guests and hosts. And in that sense, also uh, this influences, of course, how we, uh, we design the programs, how we interact with those visiting the city, and also, of course, how we communicate. And uh, the group concluded also somehow that it's very crucial now to tell stories, uh, to uh, rely on narratives, uh, to, uh, to connect to, to people, to allow this interaction uh, to, uh, to people. And uh, in that sense, also um, initiatives like, uh, for example, inviting individual journalists have proven to be uh, a very interesting or promising approach because this allows also uh, to, uh, to create a real experience and to, to make these multipliers also feel and understand um, the city's new narratives, the city's new stories. Tourism, that's the, one of the ghosts, or one of the, not only, that, not, not just ghosts, one of the <laughs> key players for European capitals of culture, one of the key players in local cultural policies, be them ECOC or not. Mm -hmm. And, and also the destructive capacity of tourism to, to pollute local cultural development. 
Now it's it's uh, such a complex and difficult debate that uh, I, I fully agree with what you said. It's an uh, unavoidable dimension, very much connected to to communication, but it is also full of uh, difficulties and full of uh, yeah challenges. Yeah, but for, maybe wait. Let's wait a little bit. Some of the preparing ECOGs, uh, they want to address this uh, new kind of tourism. So I want to highlight here the example of Badischl Salzkammergut 2024. So they have a whole program strand somehow to, to keep it, to say it in my words, about reinventing cultural tourism and also to find new ways away from mass tourism and et cetera. So let's see what, uh, what is coming out also of these kind of, uh, of new ad adventures. And it's completely clear that it's, it, it's challenging uh, when we see that we are having these huge income dependencies. So regional growth depends often to up to 50% uh, on, uh, on tourism income. And at the same time, we see that these unsustainable practices cannot continue like that. But afterwards, it's about jobs, it's about income. Uh, then in cultural tourism, it's about doing uh, these kind of activities in another way, in a more on a more human scale, uh, more participative, more interactive, also more in the sense also of reciprocal cultural understanding, uh, multicultural dimension. But it's a very very challenging and and tricky thing. By the way, as many other of these transformation areas we are having ahead of us. Yes, absolutely. The it is it is also uh, important that you, you mentioned the new narratives, the new the new stories that uh, the European capitals of culture generate. This is also we, we cannot forget the the, the say, more conventional uh, media, TV, radio, and uh, mm. the tension between the national operators and the and the local operators because now most of the European capitals of culture are not the capitals. And, and there is always, uh, say this, one of the, the key elements of, a, of a local, local, local vibrancy, cultural local vibrancy, is the existence of a, of a powerful media generator that reaches all people living in a place. Mm -hmm. That it's the only source of information is not the national TV or the national radio, but the local uh, content. Uh, did you discuss about this in 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 Vesprem? This yeah. this uh, say balance between support that national media should give to to a small and medium size scale initiatives. Uh, as you know, uh, all these topics, uh, we had three main topics with partnership, communication and financing. We could fill full week of, of, of uh, exchange and of learning and of good practices and of debates. So uh, we did not specifically uh, discuss uh, the, the role of national media, but what is also came out of the shorter discussions we had also on media was that, uh, and this is very clear, uh, ECOGs do not have uh, a communication budget which allows them to buy space on uh, national TV to an extent that this becomes a real media campaign. This is much, much too expensive. So based on the experience of many of past and current ECOGs, it's much more about finding partnerships. Uh, it works to a certain extent also with the media. Uh, from own observation, also when I, I see an Austrian media landscape, I would say it works to a limited extent. And it remains in niche programs, so often uh, cultural programs. And even there, it can be that the journalists do not really further dig into the very nature of a new European capital of culture. So in many journalists, it's still this idea, this is the one year celebration. Then there is already the question from the journalist, and who is next year? 
So in that sense, you understand that they are looking for some cultural program, the related highlights, what could be maybe also interesting for their target audience. But there is a big, big lack of a deeper understanding about the, the whole ambitions which are behind uh, the new European capital of culture framework. All right, let me close this, this first round with, uh, with a question also related to the same successful European capitals of culture that, that uh, finished, uh, say, in the tens uh, and that are still, or even before, that are still considered as an example or you could consider as an example, uh, inspirational examples for, for current capitals and for future capitals. Is there any city that comes to my mind, to your mind, uh, any, any city you would like to, to highlight uh, for its good balance in, say, partnerships, financing, and communication, the European and international dimension of the, of the ECOC? Mm. Uh, maybe not all in all. Uh, but uh, what we can um, observe is that some of the ECOCs in the, in the past years, and I would maybe go back 15 years, remain somehow in the European and international circles on, on different levels. Uh, so, for example, I, um, I think uh, most of you uh, would say that Liverpool was a European capital of culture. And this is also because there is a continuous research, there is evaluation activity, there was a celebration 10 years after, after the ECOC, etc. So this is, for example, one, one element or one city uh, from where we must also objectively, I think, say this is a successful European capital of culture project. And it was also possible really to have a profile, to take uh, something more recent where there are interesting developments uh, is, for example, related to Matera. Uh, because Matera is able, it seems, to continue after the year quite actively. I think they were initiators of uh, this expo uh, activity, Dubai Expo, where at the Italian pavilion, different European capitals of culture were shown. But I do not only see them again in this context, I see them also on all kinds of strategic EU activities where they appear, where they are project partner, where they engage, etc. So in that sense, it seems also that there is a certain uh, still fire behind and, and people bringing the, the, project, uh, the project forward. Uh, both what I've said does not say that I think that they had the best ever ECOC program, but just uh, to, to see that uh, obviously in these two cases, it was possible to continue to have a real legacy and also to have a profile. Because if somebody would now ask me about evaluation and research, I would say Liverpool. And if somebody would ask me now about outside EU communication, I would say Matera. And this is already a success. Yeah, so that means they, they became visible in, in, in these areas. And maybe this is also a message, a general message for, because your question was also from whom can we learn and who is interested. So in that sense, I think there is not something like a 100% successful ECOC, which has succeeded in all areas. It's more about really to see these wells of different experiences yeah, and then to, to, to find where are the most interesting elements, for example, also to say something completely uh, different, which we did not discuss now, uh, but which would be also a topic of international cooperation, it's skills and capacities and, and, and all these area. And for example, I think that uh, uh, from, from concept and implementation, the capacity building program of Kaunas is very interesting interesting yeah and i could also imagine that this is something which will remain good great examples we're going to listen to next year's european capital of culture we have 
three, three uh, people uh, representing Vesprem uh, Balaton 2023, Cristina Forro, the senior project manager on outreach and capacity building, the international relations manager, Julia Butch, uh, and Nemet Sarolta, the SME uh, projects coordinator team. Please go ahead, a pleasure you are here. Okay, thank you very much. I invite uh, to the floor my nice colleague Julia as well, because we, are, uh, we prepared our presentation together as we were together on this project uh, from the beginning. I, I am the project coordinator of the academic camp, what was held in Hungary. And Julia is, uh, was our advisor to build up the whole program. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, greetings from uh, Vesprim. We are uh, really in uh, Vesprim in the offices. And greetings from our team, Vesprim Balaton 2023. Um, uh, I would like to thank, uh, uh, in the name of our whole, whole ECOC team, for this wonderful opportunity to be a part of this Academic Camp uh, series. So uh, thank you, uh, Interas, Mercedes, uh, Fran. Thank you, uh, Silvia, um, uh, <laughs> worked uh, with you. It was a wonderful time and we, we have learned a lot uh, from you and uh, together uh, with you. Um, and I thank you also uh, for this uh, opportunity today, uh, Jordi, and uh, also thanks for the last talk with, uh, in the circle of ENC, ENCATC, and also for the podcast possibility, because, uh, yeah, we got many possibilities uh, through this uh, academic camp, what we have uh, had in November and the end of November. I wanted to give a, a small uh, introduction of our uh, city, um, uh, also to better understanding, uh, to have a better understanding of our work, and uh, also uh, reflecting what, what uh, Silvia said in her presentation. We are one of the small cities. Uh, we have only uh, 60,000 inhabitants in, in our uh, city, West Brim. Um, it's uh, 110 kilometers from Budapest, uh, um, uh, West Prim, and uh, in, in the north of the Balaton Lake, uh, maybe you know, it's the largest uh, um, um, freshwater uh, lake um, um, in uh, the middle of uh, Europe, it's Central Europe. Uh, we have some uh, mountains in the north, um, and uh, it is really characteristic that this is the city of Queens because the first uh, uh, queen uh, was, uh, of Hungary was uh, uh, crowned here in the city, uh, uh, around 1,000. Um, and we have the title since uh, 2019 uh, as a UNESCO city of music. We have a different... Uh, uh, long existing festivals like Westprim Fest, uh, our uh, violin festival, classical festival, uh, the street music festival, um, and uh, the early music days. And uh, we are speaking about Westprim, or you know Westprim is the city, uh, won the title, just um, um, the, the whole region is added to our project, and that's why we are calling uh, Vesprim Balaton uh, 2023, uh, because um, to our project, there are 120 settlements and uh, municipalities involved uh, at this moment, and we are covering uh, a territory uh, which has at about a half a million inhabitants. So it's very a uh, large population uh, uh, comparing to the 60,000 inhabitants in Vesprim. This was a short introduction about our city and about our academic camp. Um, um, you were talking about the different topics. So we were talking uh, about uh, partnerships, communication and financing, but I'm giving uh, the word to uh, Christy. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, this will be our presentation like this. We will switch from one another. But uh, to highlight the main topics, uh, you can see them on, on the screen. Uh, we wanted to talk about uh, them in an international um, level because we have realized 
uh, while we were working on the, the topic of our academic camp, that international relationships, partnerships, or international communication, and also uh, the international financing opportunities are the fields that we have to develop within our team and with our um, partners as well. Because um, to tell the truth, it's a, it's a big thing to, to be brave enough to apply for international uh, funds, or to get a partnership from abroad. And our cultural institutes, for example, uh, have to be encouraged to do this um, on a long-term period. There are some cultural institutes which already do this, but uh, we have to um, embrace the others as well. Uh, while we were organizing the event, our academic camp, we had to face the issue of uh, COVID and uh, this um, pandemic situation. Uh, our uh, program was held in November, so we were hesitating with Sylvia and Fran while we were uh, organizing the event, if we should do it online or offline and excluding our international uh, family members. So we uh, decided to have an hybrid event where what we organized in a really nice area in a museum in a color gallery. Uh, but all the presentations in the morning session were uh, shared with our partners, with our ECOG family members internationally online. So they could join the discussions, they could join uh, the lessons as well. So there were around um, 55 local members uh, who were listening to the, the, the lectures. And there were 44 online participants during the session. So it's a quite big team who could learn from this academic camp. And it's uh, a thing that we are really proud of. And we could uh, involve 15 speakers during our program. So it's a really uh, nice number of participants all together. Um, we listed the members who participated on the, the academic camp. There were not only our own ECOC members, uh, project managers, but also the cultural institutes could be presented from West Prem and from the region. And as I mentioned, there were other ECOC cities uh, presented during the lectures. So, and some general uh, summary. Um, um, it was a very um, inspiring thing to work out of our uh, offices. And uh, Christina mentioned the House of Arts of West Prem, and it was a really unique environment to work and to get uh, new ideas. It was also a really a good uh, opportunity um, to know each other better and uh, work with other colleagues, not in the normal uh, setting of our work, and also to work with, uh, with uh, colleagues from uh, our cultural institutions. Uh, we, we work very closely uh, with uh, the cultural institutes here in West Prem. There are as uh, 15, as, uh, as I, I, I know uh, very well. And uh, we are meeting them every month in a, in a monthly meeting, but it was a special opportunity to, to, to work not only for one hour, but for a longer time. And, um, and uh, it was also um, uh, a great opportunity uh, within the, the ECOC uh, team um, uh, to know uh, the colleagues uh, better and they, they knew uh, new thoughts and to see other perspectives from other cities. Yeah, so we could uh, strengthen the partnership within our ECOC team but also outside of our ECOC team as well. And it was really nice to see and, from learn, and to learn from our ECOC family members how they managed their own uh, COVID situation in the past and how they are preparing for any occasional uh, things that we don't know yet. So we could learn good practices uh, how to establish international connections uh, during the pandemic, but also to be flexible, to learn plan 
to to learn how to plan everything um, again and again. So it was really great. Uh, we listed the topics on the right corner, uh, what we could um, reach on our, I think on our second day was the partnerships. Uh, and we could also invite, uh, thanks to Sylvia, a uh, presenter from Canada and we could learn from him. And it's also really important to not to forget that there are countries outside Europe as well who are really happy and to, to join us during our journey and to help us um, and uh, to share their experiences because they have also cultural programs, strategies, uh, fundings, what they would like to share with us. So it was really great to see this open-minded and helpful um, participation during our academic camp sessions. And what we have learned from our um, puppet theater manager uh, who highlighted it, that it's really important to put energy and time to these partnerships because uh, from this mentality or on this mentality can we can build the partnerships, strong partnerships, which which are from long term. And um, I think I would I would highlight this word mentality, which is really, really important uh, for the future and for legacy as well. Yes, uh, international uh, building international relations uh, takes time, uh, but it it's worth of it uh, to work on it. Um, the second day was about uh, international communication, and we have uh, excellent uh, speakers uh, from Linz and also Rijeka uh, um, and also Polina from Wroclaw, uh, who is uh, today with us. Um, from Linz, from the presentation, we, we have learned uh, that that uh, we should show uh, the real face of a city, of our city, and also uh, to know better our everyday heroes and also show our everyday heroes and everyday life, because we can know a, a lot of things about the city uh, from Wikipedia. So uh, we, should, uh, we should go closer uh, to the citizens of a city. Uh, Paulina mentioned, um, uh, less is more, and a stable team is really important within an ECOC uh, a team and also for communication. Uh, it was her advice. Um, and uh, we should have a balanced image for the city uh, to recognize easily, not to complicate. Um, and um, we mentioned or we, we saw, because we had a panel, a panel discussion with uh, um, communication colleagues from ECOC, uh, different ECOC uh, uh, members, like from Konas, from ASH, uh, uh, Paulina uh, was also part of this discussion. And we saw we need more platform for, for uh, so kind of uh, uh, discussions. It is really helpful to know um, uh, each other's work and to, to get knowledge. And as uh, Sylvia mentioned, uh, what is going to happen with this knowledge that we are building up and it's, it's uh, stuck in ourselves but it's also uh, need to be shared among us and uh, to be kept, kept for 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 long, longer period. And about financing, our last day was uh, about learning from different uh, international and European funds, uh, learning about them and um, what we had to realize and keep in mind that it's really important to have a person who is um, who knows everything about international funds because there are quite many what we can apply for and for uh, participating on any of these uh, international collaborations it's a really great initiator to apply for any of uh, the the listed um fund opportunities and to to have a legacy project or to maintain or sustain our uh, programs 
uh, we need the help of the European Union as well. And it's really important to, to know everything, all details and to know where to find them, how to manage uh, financing projects, because um, sometimes it's much easier than we would think. Um, it's also uh, a lesson learned that uh, are, are, as I mentioned before, that our cultural institutes are sometimes afraid to apply for international partnerships, and it's the same with uh, international fundings as well. But if there is a knowledge what we can use within our team, uh, it makes it much more easier. Um, also, international funding is really important for international workshops. And um, these could be managed by a dedicated person, what we are lacking uh, in the present. And we plan to have or plans to have one, which is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it's also um, a link what what Sylvia said, and that it's 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 uh, it's supporting what Sylvia said. Uh, in small cities, they are not experienced with with writing uh, grants, and mm -hmm. uh, we should start with the smallest one and not directly with the Creative Europe one. And actually, among our institutes, I mentioned in a previous call. Um, uh, we have only uh, two uh, Creative Europe projects uh, running in our city, what we know. So it is also a sign that we should support. And uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, four Erasmus Plus projects now running in our cultural institutes. It's more easy uh, to uh, submit and we have to work on it and uh, encourage uh, our institutions also. Some pictures. <laughs> Uh, a very, really uh, artistic atmosphere, we could work. And um, we would like to thank you for your kind attention uh, on behalf of our West Brim Balaton 2023 team. Christy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much, Julia. That was, that was uh, very useful, very complete. Now the, 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 the floor will be given to uh, Sarolta Nemeth, I'm working as a researcher at the Karelian Institute of the University of Eastern Finland, so pretty far from Espre and Hungary. And uh, I am working as, the, as a member of the coordination team of an Interreg Europe project, which uh, includes five ECOCs. So it's basically we, we have a partnership of European Capitals of Culture who have uh, got the title in the consequent years. So the first one is Leo Warden from 2019, then Matera, no, 2018, Matera, 2019, then Rieka, 2020, for them with the COVID hitting the project. Then Timisoara, whose original year was 21, but now it's in 23. And finally Kaunas. So these are our five cities. And, five cities uh, and six years. That's quite, quite funny. No, uh, yeah. It's, it's, we, we managed together so that they can learn um, very fast from each other in inter-regional inter exchange because it's an inter Europe project. And our aim is to um, promote local development through promoting local entrepreneurship, local SMEs and communities in the framework of the ECOCs so that they ban these benefits, the ECOC programs and the legacy, as well as local companies benefit from the legacy and the ECOC pro project. That was right. the original uh, idea and uh, the pro pro project is soon over. We've been running parallel with yours and unfortunately we were not included in any other academic camps, although I think we would have had a lot of things to share, but at least now. So I have a presentation of which the first few slides I will show and that basically tells the framework and then I will share with you the links <coughs> go into the details about the actions and the cities, what they've done in our projects. So this is an inter Europe project started in 2019, in that happy year where we were not aware of COVID, and we were very enthusiastic starting uh, inter-regional exchanges with these cities. The, the need came from the fact that we noticed, and these cities also uh, acknowledged, that there doesn't exist any support framework, especially financial incentive, for these cities to to closely cooperate 
and work out together solutions to their shared problems, which are in the planning phase, the implementation phase, and also in the legacy phase of their projects. And they were all interested in this issue, how to involve better the youth, young entrepreneurs, small and medium-sized enterprises in this program or in this in their projects change and, the slide and they all they all i am not there yet, Agi. and um sorry this is my co-coordinator agnes nemet who is sometimes warning me and it's fine uh, so the basically the the thing is that um, uh, i don't know how much do you know interreg europe it's a different it's a different uh, um, program from the other interreg programs the aim is to improve policy instruments. So to influence the spending of EU money or other budgets of municipalities or regions, public actors are involved in these projects, mostly as partners. And the key stakeholders are those who actually have the money, the funds in their hands. So for example, the regional operational programs or city strategies have been affected by our partners' work in their own regions or cities. That was that's the interreg uh, rule. That's that's the aim, and so they all found a, a particular measure or objective under their operational programs or city strategies, which related to the objectives of our of our project, which is basically answering questions or solutions. How could local, small, and medium-sized enterprises be engaged in and strengthened through European capitals of culture, and uh, for to influence these measures or objectives or improve them, make them more effective, they had to create action plans. The first two years of our project from 2019 to 20 was spent on developing actions, developing action plans for, for to achieve this promotion of local SMEs and new entrepreneurship, mainly by way of increasing cross-sectoral cooperation and looking for ways to link local entrepreneurship to the European capital of culture in a positive long and this positive long-term legacy. So as, as this has not been really part of the ECO program explicitly, so there's not an eligibility criteria that SMEs have to be brought on board. And it, it's part of the general engagement uh, requirement of communities and local residents and local stakeholders. But we wanted to focus on this particular aspect. If I go on, sorry, hit the other button. Uh, I show you shortly the actual partnership and a little bit about our funding and, and funder, but then I go on. This was the methodology of our work. So the first two years was about developing these actions, and the last year was to implement these actions and monitor uh, their implementation, evaluate the impact of success or failure. And uh, the, what is the unique and, and really good uh, practice what we want to share with you in our project is basically stemming from the Interreg Europe programs requirements, but also from our insistence on engaging as many and as diverse and a wide set of stakeholders as possible in, within the regions, within the cities. So we had equal emphasis and effort on internal stakeholder learning processes and workshops and external inter-regional, inter, inter so interreg, interregional um, learning and exchanges of good practices. And these were not just running parallel, but there were instances where they were connected digitally with uh, online uh, workshops where stakeholders could also join us uh, and the international interregional learning got mixed up. But also sometimes uh, when COVID still allowed or before COVID, we even carried some stakeholders with us to our project workshops and site visits to other cities within the Interact Projects framework. And um, um, various uh, input output uh, um, processes happened between these intra-regional and uh, inter-regional workshops while we had the same questions that we did in these workshops and inputs were coming from from what was learned from other regions down to the stakeholders, where it was further developed. And then the results of that workshop and development was then shared with the other regions again in the next project workshop when we had an interregional uh, session. It, this, this took a lot of meetings, a lot of discussion, a lot of communication, basically monthly engaging stakeholders and our partners in conversations 
um, emails, exchanges um, online and on-site meetings. Um, we also structured the two years around the key topics that were defined in the initial phase of the project. The first action was to look for potential, regional potentials and needs, specific problems that needs to be so, uh, solved. So stemming from that work, we um, basically identified the problem of uh, cross-sectoral cooperation and engagement of more, more non-traditional stakeholders in the ECOC. So not just the cultural sector, but the creative industries, then also um, um, any educational institutions, um, any company uh, or smaller and medium sized uh, businesses in the cities. So really, really sports, uh, NGOs, whoever. So to, to have a broad uh, set of stakeholders in these workshops also. So that was uh, very important. And uh, the other important focus was uh, the topic of uh, of a legacy so how to actually already plan the legacy from the beginning not just during the ECOC year when there's no resources and time to actually pay attention to legacy issues so labor them with very good legacy program could show a good example in this and also Matera um, uh, managed to uh, reach quite good results with that despite uh, what COVID did to all these cities actually um, in, in, the, in the effectiveness of their work so Action that plans were developed, they had to be endorsed and signed by those authorities who own the structural funds or other budgets. And money was assigned to implement these actions developed in the two years. And these actions actually have been implemented. Almost all of them, a few of them are still running now, end of May, June, maybe early July, but more or less the action plans have been, have been already um, implemented. And there's, uh, I ran a kind of a rough um, summary of what kind of actions these have been. So very different things, different uh, ways because of different regions, different, different needs and different potential, different situations. There were, we had actions which strengthened the cultural and creative sector linked to the, the eco project, then governance innovation for local collaborative ecosystems to develop cultural sites that was in Patera, then mobilizing youth and education, especially in Kaunas, but also targeted training um, um, for the creative uh, and cultural um, startups or young people who would like to start a business, as well as um, awareness raising on a larger scale in the whole city, big hackathons and fairs were organized in Timisoara, uh, making a wider and a more cross-sectoral uh, user base for a platform which then digitally they have created on the city website to continue this work during the echo here and also hopefully afterwards with, with all these stakeholders and, and uh, create synergies and new ideas. Uh, also some digital solutions, an interesting one from RIECA, the, the Creative Doctors, which is actually helping uh, small enterprises to, to get some help, support, advice for mentors, those who are more experienced in, uh, in doing business in the creative um, sector from handicrafts of all sorts of digital and interesting solutions. Um, and it's been a success. They just use basically Facebook for that. But all these details you can find, and now I will skip the actual examples, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you find on our project website, which is an Interreg Europe's website, ECOG SME, um, action plans are published there, signed action plans, news already in the last one year about implementation, and we have a final dissemination event just within a month from now, which is open to anyone to uh, join online. At least uh, most of our sessions will be live online streamed and audience can interact and send comments and ask questions. But of course, everyone is welcome to Matera on the 9th and 10th of June to, to come and uh, join us in person and also see also in person Matera's uh, solutions and, and developments and um, in a site visit, which is organized on the second day. So I really want to encourage everyone who has the means and the time in such a short notice to come and, and see what we've done. But if not, then the website has a lot of information. So please browse and, and contact us and the cities uh, if you are interested in any good practice or anything is, has raised your interest. Thank you.
Kiitos uh, Saralta. This was uh, Nemet, uh, Nemet Saralta. Um, Nemet. Saralta um, is, my, is my Christian name and Nemet is my family name. <clears throat> it's it's uh, a great presentation. Thank you. It's a great project. I, I, I was not aware of, of the work you have done in, in, this, uh, in this very important topic. And we will consider it for sure in our, in our report of this Academy Camp 5. If you wish to convert this PowerPoint or to select some of the slides and share it with the, the audience of this Academy Camp, feel free to upload it to the, to the chat because you have uh, lots of very interesting uh, information, learnings, uh, very useful uh, to us all. Uh, thank you again. I will do that. I make a PDF and then it will be there. No problem. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, Paulina, uh, Vroclav 2016. Um, Sylvia mentioned that you are one of the few capitals that have managed to keep the, the flame, keep the fire uh, of international connectivity, the intelligence uh, uh, alive. Paulina, you have, you have the floor representing Vroclav 2016. Hello, everybody. Thank you. To, it's nice to see you on Zoom this time in summer, because last time with many of you when we met, Theoretically, in, I was the one who was joining it from outside. It was another season. Yeah, I would like to share some some words from Wrocław 2016 because it's also been many years now, um, like it's eight years ago. So I think plus the including the two COVID years. So I think it's like a long history behind us. And I had this privilege to be there from 2015 until now. So and observe also the organization, how it, as you said, uh, was in flames <laughs> and then maybe in smaller fire, but still didn't extinguish, <laughs> let's call it like this. No, of course, I'm joking. Uh, we still have an institution. The institution is the legacy institution that in between changed the name, first ones, now the structure since this year, but it's still there including um, to some extent or even to big extent the same people and this is what I think Sylvia said and it was also repeated in different parts of academy uh, camps of this continuity this I would say sustainability of projects of cultural projects and especially of international collaborations and and why is that I think uh, one of the reasons is that they are quite complex or they may be quite complex projects. So you need someone experienced and you need someone who have this expertise and experience. So it's really worth to keep the person who went through, let's say the first Creative Europe or the first Erasmus or what was called the Open Action in old days, or just like had this experience went this way once uh, and then can uh, either run it again or give expertise to the other people because i think a lot of these complaints that were also addressed here saying that smaller institutions don't want to apply or some cultural institutions they just use the the usual funds and the usual ways it's also because to be honest these are complicated issues yes of course not every application and opportunus and now let's hope that the erasmus plus for culture will be the solution for complications but if you look at the standard let's call the uh, creative Europe, the standard one, these are rather complex things. So experienced people are needed. So then you have the ECOG, you build capacity of the organization, some cities bigger, some smaller, and of other institutions, and also now a creative uh, sector enterprises as well. So it's really, I think, a pity not to continue then with prolonging using this expertise and keeping these people somehow involved in the city. Wrocław is a big city. It's like over half a million. So this thing of people just fleeing to the capital or another big city is not so big like in some, uh, like we know from some other former ECOs, but still at some level of your personal development, you think it's Warsaw or nothing, so to say, <laughs> Warsaw or Brussels. And I see here a big role of the ECOC 
and the um, eco legacy because it doesn't have to be eco it can be the the museums the other the whole eco ecosystem as we call it to keep those people uh, in uh, to, to, to keep the people, let's say, employed, keep them engaged, use the skills they have and also the connections they have. And this is what we succeeded to some extent in Wrocław, that even though the organization got much smaller after the end of ECO, it's not that we continuing like it was, so many or those who wanted of the people got employed in some other state institutes or institutions were kind of pitched and presented by uh, by other activists as those who went through this way and can now be uh, in in use and use their capacities. Speaking of capacities, I, I mentioned the uh, applications and this whole formal system, but of course another even more important, I would say, aspect. Sorry if I speak fast. I'll slow down. Are connections and contacts. And I'm saying that especially now because after 2016 and the years after, then came COVID. And we could clearly see how COVID cut this connection and how those people, also our colleagues who started their, their career or their hope for career in international relations within 2020, how super different reality they entered, yeah? Like when you can get to know people in Zoom, when you need to make friends with them in Zoom, when in different languages you need to explain your idea of a project that may not even take place because of COVID, and then apply together and then discuss complicated issues. And it was such a different specifics of these discussions and of these whole meetings, let's call them meetings. I find it still funny to, to say you met someone on Zoom because it's still video conferencing. But still, as I said, I'm old, so maybe that is why. And then, um, so I'm saying when now, let's hope the reality, that the old reality is back there and one can meet. And there are people, it's important to invest in uh, building relations, in getting to know people, and then also, again, uh, supporting and employing and empowering those people who have this connection because they do contribute to the cultural development of the city with this what they already have uh, in their potential. Mm, uh, yeah, COVID I mentioned, I tried to make, aha, and the third, I, it's third, but probably the most important why the legacy here somehow succeed is of course the support of municipality. Yeah, it was from beginning on municipal project, municipality in the, in the figure of city mayor was very much behind it and through all the difficult way was behind it. And also uh, after 2016, when it finished for municipality and then the mayor that changed, it was also kind of clear, we want to refer to this uh, heritage, to this legacy. We want to tell the story of us and ECOX. We want to say that, I don't know, we have the cooperation with past country that we never had before. And we want to invest in this cooperation till today. So, um, but this is, um, I think we were lucky to have it. And I think many cities also are, but this is like, a, if you are in a municipal, in a public body, then this like public support is super important. It's not always the city, it's sometimes the state. In, can, in Poland, it, you're lucky if it's the city, rather not the state. Mm, but still, when you have experienced people, people with this flame and, and connections and the support of municipality, then I think there are three, three kind of conditions uh, how to succeed. Did I answer your question, Jordi? <laughs> you did. You did. It was it was a very good answer, and and I I, I enjoyed it very much. You you explained it uh, well how it operated and how it is uh, still still alive. Um, I I remember that one of the main um, news I had from uh, Rockluff was a, a wonderful book, Culture and Human Rights, uh, an initiative of your mayor. Uh, and fundamental uh, book on on cultural rights uh, with with very clear explanations on what it means uh, uh, wonderful work and yeah it's it's a wonderful legacy one of the components of your wonderful legacy uh, may i say one more thing because now we need to 
book, it also, it, it's what I'm going to say, it's intertwined with my questions about the uh, out of Europe connections and generally international cooperation as a way or a tool for networking. Because Wrocław, apart from being European capital of culture, was the UNESCO World Book Capital in the years 2016-17, which was also important because we had our book program and, 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 and literature and books is important here. And uh, after, after us, the next city was Konakry. Um, and this is how somehow Wrocław got involved in this network. We also in the uh, earlier mentioned ICORN. And a few years later, uh, Olga Tokarczuk got the Literature Nobel Prize and she's the inhabitant of the city. So right now for us, it's like, you know, literature is the thing, uh, but it's also that this is also a legacy of ECO. I'm not saying she wouldn't get it without ECO. I'm just saying that literature was also involved and the UNESCO Book Capital was also involved. So these different networks and these different levels of cultural life, it doesn't have to be the, the ECO office, whatever it's called. It's just to support the culture. And then you can see, how these different flames, I would come back to this um, comparison, started, you know, sparkles, how they flame later. And this is what I think what is super inspiring. Great, great that you mentioned Olga Tokarczuk, wonderful writer. If, if uh, go and take one of her books, she's amazing. Let's go now to the, to the Mediterranean uh, coast, to, to Rijeka, Irena. Irena Kregar Segota. Hi, hi everybody. You were the chief executive officer in Rijeka during during the capital year, the difficult months of the pandemic. But still, please let us know how you managed to keep the European and the international dimension, the lessons you learned uh, in those difficult months, the current situation, what what. Uh, is the situation one year and a half after the end of the capital year? Well, no, you were extended, right? Yes, we we had an extension for a couple of months. But first of all, hello, everybody. I'm very happy. Thank you for the invitation. Very happy to be here and to share uh, some of the things that uh, uh, Rieka learned. Uh, uh, it's a very vast topic, European dimension, European cooperation, international cooperation. And uh, we can really talk about it for days. It goes from uh, international communication to international productions, uh, uh, all the way to involving uh, international audiences. And from uh, what uh, we heard from previous speakers, I mean, each city, I would say, has really good examples of projects, uh, uh, good ideas of uh, how to, to strengthen European dimension. Uh, at the beginning, I would really like to to, to say some general things. Uh, first of all, that we thought that it was important to have a very cohesive idea from the bidding time to the implementation, all the way to, to the evaluation and legacy of what kind of European uh, cooperation, international cooperation is, uh, is needed. And in that sense, uh, I would encourage you, no matter what phase of, uh, of your project you are in, to really try to think in a long-term uh, 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 framework. Uh, it's not always easy to do, but uh, this will help you not to sh really uh, lose your energy or start projects uh, that, uh, that do not have real future or that will exhaust your resources. Because we all know that although we have several years after the designation, the time really passes quickly and the uh, implementation year, uh, celebration year is just there. So first of all, I would really like to start with uh, pointing some problems and issues that it's uh, very good to think about. Uh, so very often uh, we do not have clear strategy. Uh, there is insufficient planning time, as I already mentioned. Uh, we start with projects that are not sustainable over time or that are too ambitious, too difficult to organize. Then there are also financial projects, financial budgets. 
uh, lack of uh, lack of uh, specialized uh, stuff that we learn because as we said the European dimension has really uh, and cooperation a lot of dimensions so you you really need different people for international co-productions or different people from uh, starting and managing uh, international uh, projects or looking for uh, for financing not to speak about uh, engaging international uh, um, audiences. Also, uh, things like what kind of geographical choices and priorities do we make? Uh, do we stay uh, regional? Do we go really global? Um, is it random or are we searching uh, new territories? Uh, also, we are requested, all of uh, ECOG cities are requested to strengthen ECOG brand and to speak about European dimensions. So this is another challenge that, would need, that we need to address in the activities that we uh, undertake. Um, when we think, you know, there are probably more and more other problems and issues that you are well aware of. But I would say as uh, uh, when we reflect upon those as maybe some kind of a, uh, of a recommendation after what Rijeka has been through, that it's really that each city needs to think and express its own uh, European uh, dimension and its own develop its own um, cooperation. And this is really defined by characteristics of city, cultural assets, history, past, very important local expectations. We, although we are talking about international, there is always this uh, duality with local uh, expectations and the expectations of different stakeholders uh, in the city. In that sense, it's very important from uh, uh, the beginning to like you have probably and you have you're you are constantly opening debate with different stakeholders on different topics so this is also something i would say that uh, that should be discussed uh, uh, not just within uh, implementing agencies organizations or your uh, immediate uh, partners cultural institutions etc but also with maybe a larger group of stakeholders because they are going to be the ones who will continue uh, in the legacy years, who will continue with uh, projects, whether some kind of networking, whether we are talking about volunteering program, uh, etc. Um, I would also say that the European cooperation and uh, uh, expressing uh, and international cooperation and expressing this uh, uh, should not be something should not be a silos, but should be integral part uh, of your program and your philosophy that uh, that you are uh, articulating uh, throughout your program. Uh, and finally, I would say that uh, it's it's very useful also to think uh, and to to look into what European Union is, uh, what kind of initiatives uh, they are uh, they are uh, stressing or or trying to to implement right now. Uh, at the moment, I have in mind the new European Bauhaus, which is a really uh, a very wide uh, European initiative that uh, with with very and very ambitious and that can be something that can be useful uh, where you can uh, uh, links can be really uh, really created uh, with uh, with your programs so what i said was some very general things and uh, and conclusions uh, uh, after our year um, I would now like to give you some examples of activities that we did regarding international uh, and European cooperation. Um, in the uh, ramp years or years leading to 2020, we really try to implement a lot of capacity buildings and but involving uh, European international partners. One of the programs was, for, for example, a joint capacity building with five other ECOGs. It was called Lab for European Project Making, where we shared uh, concerns, issues, but also knowledge and experiences between five uh, ECOGs. Uh, we obviously developed very strong uh, link with Galway 2020 uh, with the informal network of ECOG cities, but also uh, tried to really develop the 
uh, concrete activities with European cultural networks like uh, Trans Europa Halles, uh, intercultural cities, airways, uh, NEMO, uh, Unique Network, etc. Uh, I'm sure you're all well familiar, familiar with those and you cooperate uh, with them. And of course, application to EU funds and programs, which are uh, useful for funds, of course, but more, uh, more so for uh, developing networks uh, that, uh, that, that last. In terms of uh, a program, I would uh, like to mention a program called 27 Neighborhoods. You can learn more about it on our uh, web page. And this, this program, which was more than a program, it was a program line that was developed for five years and uh, ran uh, in, uh, throughout the whole 2020. It's a good example, not just of international cooperation, but also of involving community. And this links on my uh, stressing how uh, uh, international and European dimension should be reflected in your program and not something, uh, something separate. 27 neighborhoods were all about 27 uh, communities in Rijeka and in the region who were linked with 27 communities in Europe, 27 um, uh, from each from each different European country. We were more of a coordinator and capacity builder for them and uh, somebody who, who helped them to, to develop this network, uh, to develop cooperation. It's a wonderful example because it's, uh, it's um, a final results were wonderful programs, but also this network that, uh, that continues to live. And finally, a few words about COVID. Thankfully, we did a lot of activities in the ramp year from 2016 till uh, March 2020, and then we had to live through this uh, horrible experience. Uh, fortunately, Rijeka was in part of the world that was not, uh, we were not in a complete lockdown. So when you, when you had 85% uh, of museums uh, shut uh, around the world, we were in summer 2020, we were able to do more than uh, 500 activities, uh, mostly with, uh, with the local partners and national partners, because of course the borders were closed, but we really tried to, to use digital tools to use platforms uh, for disseminating what we were doing, but also for keeping uh, existing networks and uh, network, networking, uh, networking alive. Um, uh, yeah, it's already been so we um, our program ended in um, uh, June uh, 2021. We had this prolong prolongation, as it was said before. Um, there is uh, the, the the municipality has taken over now, and the city department of culture is the one who is uh, taking care of the legacy. But also uh, different our different partners who who participated in all of our activities, uh, namely cultural institutions and associations who are our partners. They they are continuing. Uh, ties with, uh, with, uh, with the whole network. Uh, some activities are going on, uh, there are links, and uh, um, I, I'm sure that, uh, that uh, everything that we, uh, uh, that we implemented really uh, strengthened the whole uh, international profile of the city and strengthened the international capacities for cooperation of the whole cultural sector locally and nationally. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> I try to be succinct. Of course, uh, uh, I could talk for hours uh, and uh, I would be happy to discuss uh, uh, any of those aspects that, uh, that I mentioned. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Irena. That was great, extremely informative. And it was a collection of wonderful insights, great examples. So be reassured that this was, this was great. It was, it was extremely useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Havala and Irena. Mercedes, Silvia, if you want to add anything before I close the session. And it was a pleasure, I would say. Isn't it, Mercedes? It was a great afternoon again. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, the, the, indeed, thank you to all of you. Huh? Uh, thank you um, to Cristina, Julia, Sarolta, Paulina, and, and, and Irena. And of course, Silvia, huh, for um, taking us through this uh, uh, afternoon uh, 
uh, with the, taken by the hand by our wonderful Jordi. And, and um, you know, Silvia, I've been thinking when, when listening to you, um, you've said it uh, on and off. Uh, um, we are humans. Uh, our species is here today uh, because we have been able to cooperate. What ha that's what makes us different from others on this planet, beyond the fact that, you know, we have a soul and uh, understand that we are finite, but we know how to cooperate. We do things together, and that is the basis of cooperation, doing things together, having an objective and working together towards that objective. And you've said this, uh, you've said this throughout this afternoon, and, and I think that we sometimes lose the vision that we know how to do it, that that is what we are all about. It is about working together and progressing together. So be it, you know, at local level, international, whatever. At the end of the day, that is what we know how to do as uh, human beings. Mm -hmm.